When people think of resting comparators, this is what they think of. Well, maybe not exactly this, but you get the idea. Comparators are scary. Scary useful, that is. Let's see how they work. The first and most interesting use of a comparator is that it reads containers. It does that by outputting a signal strength, which is just the number of pieces of redstone in a row that it lights up. As you can see, this chest isn't very full, so it's got a low signal strength. But this furnace is more full than the chest, even though it has fewer slots, it's a greater percentage full. So it will output a greater signal. Containers don't actually need to have slots for you to fill, they can just contain things like disks, for example. As you can see, this outputs a signal strength of 6. The signal strength that a disk outputs is unique for almost every disk. They started doubling up disks after they added pig steps, so it doesn't really work fully anymore, but it's still a cool idea. If you want to get a very specific redstone signal, you can do that very easily with auto crafters, as the maximum that they can output is 9, and they have 9 slots. So you can fill in one of these to get another redstone signal, or you can just disable each slot, which will increase the redstone signal by 1 one per slot. It doesn't require any division stuff like these ones require, but it's also limited because it can only go up to 9. If you want to go all the way up to 15, you can use a lectern. This works in much of the same way, it just gives an output based on the page number. As you can see, when we're on page 7, it outputs 7. This goes up to 15, and if you go to a page after 15, it just outputs a signal strength of 15. Things like cauldrons and composters will get another signal for every layer that they have. Once we fill this up completely, it goes up to 7, but then it increases by 1 when it has bone meal at the top. The copper bowl with a comparator makes a T flip flop. A T flip flop is a circuit that, when powered, will flip the state of this piece of redstone. As you can see, when it's off, it'll turn on, and when it's on, it'll turn off. You might think, well, why don't you just use a lever? Well, levers are player driven, and sometimes you have things that are buried in circuits where they give out a temporary redstone signal. If you want to get a permanent redstone signal from that, you'd have to use something like a T flip flop. And the last thing I want to look at with comparators reading containers is this chest. As you can see, it's reading it through a block, and in fact, you can read any of these through a block and it will output a signal strength of 15 because this is completely full. We can learn two things from this. First of all, if you're reading through a block, it'll essentially grant one more piece of redstone that it travels because you're starting from one block later. And second of all, snow blocks stack up to 64, but snow balls only stack up to 16. Powdered snow buckets only stack up to one. So that's why these are all considered full stacks because you couldn't possibly fit another item into this container without taking something out like that. So it will output a signal strength of 15 even though some of the stacks are only at 1 or 16. So now let's see what happens when we put a redstone signal into the back of a comparator. If we turn this on and pay attention to this piece of redstone, you can see that when I replace this with the comparator, that piece of redstone lightens up a little bit. It's pretty subtle because the signal strength doesn't increase as dramatically as it would with a repeater, for example. That's because this only outputs exactly what's being put behind it. So our signal strength goes 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 11, 10 instead of going something like 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Now I could preserve this signal strength by using a line of comparators, but there's a much more efficient way to do it, and that's like this. This piece of redstone powers this block, which turns on this comparator. This comparator powers this block, which turns on this piece of redstone, and that cycle continues until we get to this lamp. As you can see, this piece of redstone is just a little bit darker than if we were to turn it on with a lever. So why would you want to preserve a signal? Well, the reasons are a little bit complicated, and it kind of has to do with making a redstone computer, which is something that we're probably not going to have to do. I just wanted to show this off to show how the comparator works, but the chances of you using one of these are not that high. Now let's talk about pulse extenders. These take a signal like this button and make it last a little bit longer. As you can see, we've got this repeater, which is at four ticks. So this signal will last an extra four ticks and this lamp turns on for a little while longer. Another way that we can extend signals is using comparator loops like this. As you can see, this diminishes the redstone signal once every time it goes into a new comparator. Our redstone signal starts at 15, so that means this lasts 15 ticks, or 1.5 seconds, plus 1 second because that's how long the button lasts. This setup over here is different for a couple of reasons. First of all, there are just more comparators, and second of all, this powers this block. So this piece of redstone gets the same signal as this comparator inputs. So the only place this redstone signal diminishes is right here, as it goes from this redstone to this redstone. Remember, signals only diminish when they go from a piece of redstone dust to another piece of redstone dust. So all of that means that this signal lasts a long time. It'll go from 15, and these all transfer 15, and then it goes down finally to 14, and then 13, and so on. For exactly how long one of these lasts, you can just do six ticks because it's six comparators, 
times 15, since you start with 15 and it diminishes down to zero. Six times 15 gives us 90 ticks or nine seconds, plus one second for the button, and that will give us a total of 10 seconds. So this is a pretty long pulse extender. We've now explored how to put things into the back of a comparator using containers and redstone, but now let's look at putting things into the side of a comparator. When a comparator is in compare mode, as you can see by this front torch being off, it will work, as we've seen, by putting a signal into the back. So this is outputting 15, 14, and then it goes through the comparator and outputs 14. If we put a signal of lower strength in the side or equal strength, as you can see this is 15, 14, so these strengths are equal, then the comparator will work like normal. But only when we put a signal that's greater strength into the side than is going into the back will the comparator turn off. This essentially becomes a cancelable piece of redstone when you're using it in circuits. One such circuit is a pulse shortener, as you can see here. This pulse lasts for exactly two ticks because it takes one tick for the comparator to turn on, it takes two ticks for the repeater to send the signal, and then it takes one tick for the comparator to become turned off after it starts receiving power. You could adjust this by making the repeater longer or adding more repeaters, but you can't make it shorter than two ticks because the way that this works is that the repeater takes priority over the comparator. So the repeater will turn on after one tick and it will power the side of this. And then it will realize that this comparator can't turn on because it's already being powered in the side. These both take one tick to turn on, but just because of the update order of the game, the repeater takes priority and so it cancels the comparator before the comparator has a chance to output anything. Here we have two identical pulse shorteners. The only difference is the thing that they're outputting into. Here we have two two tick repeaters, and here we have a four tick repeater. If we turn this on, this one actually lasts for a little bit longer. The reason for this is that repeaters will always output at least their tick count. What this does is essentially turn the repeater on and store the signal for four ticks and then output a signal for four ticks. This rarely makes a difference in redstone contraptions, but it's just good to know, so you can know that this is different from this, when we usually wouldn't think of them as different. So next, let's talk about comparators in subtract mode, indicated by the front torch being turned on. Now, these work exactly the same way as comparators that we've seen before, when you only put a signal into the back. When we put a signal into the side, however, this will subtract the back signal and the signal on the side. Here we have the signal in the back as 14, and here the signal into the side is 13. So 14 minus 13 is one. So we'll output a signal strength of one. And we can see that that's one because it will not light up this lamp. If we were to turn this on, which makes a signal strength of 14, which is the same as the signal in the back, then it will cancel out because 14 minus 14 is zero. If we have an even bigger signal, then it would be something like 14 minus 15, which if it's negative, then it just defaults to zero. This is useful in applications like this. Here we have a signal of 15 going into the back, then it outputs 15, 14, 13, and then we have 15 minus 13 is two. So it outputs two, one, zero. 15 minus zero is 15, so it continues the cycle. So it will constantly flash between a signal of 15 and two. Here we have to have the copper bulb at this distance because if you had it any closer, then it would be 15, 14, which would turn it on. And then the signal would be two, one, so the redstone line never actually turns off. So it has to be far enough to be able to turn on and off. And this is a super useful redstone contraption for farms. If you're filling up this dropper with some kind of hopper setup, then it will automatically dispense the items that it's containing. But of course, things like this get annoying pretty quick, so I'm gonna take them out. This may look like it shouldn't be far enough to turn off, but it's actually three away, one, two, three, just like this one. So after it outputs two, one, zero, this does actually turn off. Our next contraption is an XOR gate. This is a gate where if you have either of these inputs on, then the lamps turn on. But if you have both inputs on, the lamps turn off. The way that this works is that right here, we have a signal of 14 going into here and 14 going into here. So as you can see, this comparator cancels out and doesn't give an output. However, here we have a signal of 13 and a signal of 11, so it does give an output of 2. However, if we increase the signal strength of both of these by turning on this lever, then they are now equal and it will give no output. This is really useful in situations like this. In a lot of houses, you have light switches where if you turn one on, then the lights will turn on, and then you can go upstairs and turn them off. Then when we want to go back downstairs, we can turn this on temporarily and then turn this back off downstairs. Either if these are both off or both on, the lamps will be off. But if either light switch is on, then the lamp will be on. The redstone behind this is fairly straightforward. All we have is redstone going up into a modified XOR gate. 
This one's a little different because we use repeaters powering the blocks here to make sure that the signals are equal. You could also power redstone dust itself if you wanted to, but this saves on materials. And it works in the same way. The only difference is that when you have this repeater on only, it can't send a signal to here, so it will just have a signal in the back and it will output that signal. And of course, it works the same way on this side where this repeater will not send a signal through this block to this piece of redstone. Now let's look at target blocks. As you can see, when we shoot near the bullseye, it will output a small signal strength, but when we get on the bullseye, it'll output a very large signal strength. Target blocks also have a admittedly more useful function of directing redstone dust. You can see here that it will accept redstone here where the normal block will not. Target blocks are solid blocks, so that means that they can be powered and then send signals to resin components around them, like this. This is really useful in compacting resin contraptions. Here we have an SR latch or an RS NOR latch. If you hear those, it just refers to something like this, where if you press this button, it will turn on this piece of redstone, and if you press that button again, it won't do anything. Then if we press this button, it'll turn on this signal, and if we press it again, it won't do anything. So it's essentially a two-state resin contraption that will only ever accept inputs from one button, and it's the opposite every time you press it. We can compact this with target blocks. So now this is only a 2x3 footprint instead of a 3x3 footprint. And we're just redirecting with the rest and with the target blocks, and it works in exactly the same way. If you want a practical application for this, we can use it to store signals. As you can see here, we have this piece of redstone that activates and stays on, and then we can paint another thing just the way that it works. It will turn this on temporarily, but don't worry about that. And then we have a really cool looking paint thing. It would normally be on a bigger scale, but you know, this is just for demonstration purposes. Then we can click this button, which is connected to the torches on all of these. So it cancels all of their signals out and resets the beautiful art that we just made. Now let's observe some observers. As you can see, they detect redstone updates, and they also detect updates when you place or break a block or when something grows. They detect block updates of a lot of forms, as you can see here, and they can even detect things like you stepping on redstone dust because that emits particles. One interesting thing is that their signal that they output is exactly one tick, which isn't really useful for us now, but it will be very useful in the next episode. Now let's move on to our second redstone challenge. Right here, we have a contraption where if we take out this diamond, it has an alarm. Only when we pull this diamond out does it release the alarm. If you want some advice, I would recommend looking at this contraption right here, the pulse shortener. It will take a pulse of any duration and cut it down. You can go ahead and pause and figure that out. But now I'm going to reveal the solution. Boom! Right here, we're looking at this barrel through a comparator. We want this alarm to be turned off by default, so we have a redstone torch here inverting that signal. We then have a pulse shortener here, which cancels out the redstone comparator after four ticks. As you can see, those circuits we were making earlier aren't set in stone with how they're built. You can do things like run repeaters directly into comparators instead of running them into redstone first. It depends on what's the smallest. Then we simply take that signal and use it to turn on the lamp, as you can see here and it will turn it on for a temporary length of time because of this pulse shortener. To reset it, all I have to do is put the diamond back in here. But that's going to be it for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed and I hope you found this episode useful. And I will see you in the next one where we'll be talking about these things. See you there!